Good afternoon. Apologies for the little bit of late start. We were getting our technical house in order, but I'm Marty Durbin, Senior Vice President of Policy at the U.S. Chamber. Welcome to Leading by Example, businesses at the forefront of sustainability and innovation. We're proud to partner with the International Emissions Trading Association as part of their, as part of their North American Climate Summit and alongside the U.N. General Assembly meetings taking place in New York City for Climate Week. I should also note that it's National Clean Energy Week with a series of great programs underway in Washington, D.C. First, just a special thanks to Dick, Dirk Forrester and his team at IETA for the collaboration that made this event possible. So as we look ahead to the events this week in advance of COP26 in just six weeks, we want today's discussion to highlight the many ways the business community is not just engaged, but leading the effort in pursuit of climate change solutions. Collaboration with government at all levels is going to be critical to the success of these efforts, but ultimately it will be the private sector that develops, finances, builds, and operates the emissions reducing technologies of the future necessary to allow us to meet our ambitious goals. So today we'll explore some of the exciting efforts underway to do just that. And to get us started, I'm honored to introduce Elliot Deringer, Senior Advisor in the Office of the Special Presidential Envoy for Climate. With talent and experience in the climate policy arena, Elliot previously worked with the Center for Climate and Energy Solutions and its predecessor organization, and also served with the White House Council on Environmental Quality. Among many other things, Elliot and his team lead efforts to work with the business community in building greater ambition in the lead up to COP26. So Elliot, thank you for joining us and the floor is yours for the next five to six minutes. Thank you, Marty, for the, the kind introduction. Thank you, Marty, for that kind introduction. Very pleased to be with you all today here on behalf of uh, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate, John Kerry. Uh, I joined Special Envoy Kerry at the White House last Friday, where President Biden was hosting a meeting of the Major Economies Forum. You may recall the Leaders Summit on Climate that uh, the President convened in April, where he brought together 40 world leaders to galvanize climate ambition on the road to COP26 this November in Glasgow. Friday's meeting was a smaller private exchange to check on progress since April and to press leaders once again on the need to strengthen ambition, not just before, but beyond Glasgow as well. The president was blunt in his assessment. He called the recent report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change a code red for humanity. We are close, he said, to the point of no return. There was a time not too long ago when those words would have struck me as hyperbole. Unfortunately, that's no longer the case. Whether it's deadly triple-digit heat in the Pacific Northwest, the latest wildfires in California, or people dying in flooded basement apartments in Queens, I think we all know that the climate crisis is here and now, and we'd be fooling ourselves if we didn't believe that things will get worse, potentially much worse, unless we quickly change course. At the State Department, our immediate focus is doing all we can to rally greater ambition by the world's largest emitting countries. The U.S. has already stepped up with an ambitious target of 50 to 52 percent below 25 levels in 2030. At the Leaders' Summit in April, other countries stepped up too, so that now countries representing more than half of global GDP are committed to emissions pathways in line with limiting warming to 1.5 degrees Celsius. The focus now is the other 45 percent. It's been clear for a long time, though, that this challenge cannot be met by governments alone. As Marty's already said, there is no solving the climate crisis without the full and sustained engagement of the private sector. Companies not only share in the stakes, they in many cases are the best sources of the solutions, too. That's why Special Envoy Kerry has placed such a high priority on engaging corporate leaders and rallying them to this cause. Wherever he travels between meetings with ministers and leaders, he always tries to carve out time to meet with business leaders too. So far this year, he's met with CEOs in India, Russia, Italy, the UK, and the UAE, and of course here in the United States. He's also met virtually with CEOs in Korea and Brazil. The awakening of the corporate community to the climate crisis is encouraging. Some companies have been climate leaders for years, Many others are now stepping up. It's been especially encouraging to see the continued growth of corporate commitment all through the pandemic. At a time when it might have been easy to step away, 
a remarkable number of countries, uh, com companies have instead taken on ambitious net zero targets. Now we need companies to translate those ambitious long-term goals into ambitious near-term investments and action. We're working on a number of initiatives to launch at COP26 that provide opportunities for companies to do precisely that. Let me mention just a few. The first two are initiatives designed to leverage the purchasing power of companies to drive decarbonization. The first focuses on technologies already at hand. The second on the next generation of technologies we'll need to get to net zero. Many companies have already committed to transition to 100% clean power and many have made tremendous strides toward that goal here in the United States. Through the Clean Energy Development Initiative, we're partnering with companies to help them achieve those goals wherever they do business. Through this initiative, companies will set ambitious, specific investment goals in countries around the world, contingent on policies that will help make that energy available and affordable. And we'll work with the governments in those countries to advance policies that will help the companies meet those goals. We're reaching out to 14 different countries, including Indonesia, Vietnam, Japan, South Africa, Brazil, and Mexico. And we expect a large number of companies will sign on by the time of Glasgow. The second initiative is focused on technologies that are not yet commercially viable, but that will be critical to achieving net, to net zero especially in hard to abate sectors like steel, cement, aviation, and shipping. The idea is to line up procurement commitments to send early demand signals that will help advance these technologies so they're ready to deploy at scale from 2030 on. These corporate commitments will complement public investment in breakthrough technologies like hydrogen, direct air capture, and zero emission industrial processes. We're pulling together a group of CEOs and partner NGOs next week to put finishing touches on the program, and we'll have more to share about it then. These are some of the ways we're helping companies align their near-term investments in action with their long-term climate goals. There are, of course, many other ways that companies can help, and sometimes it's as simple as lifting their voices. We need those voices. We need them emphasizing the urgency of the moment, the need for greater ambition, and the enormous economic opportunities to be had in the net zero transition. We know of a number of efforts underway to elevate the corporate voice on climate ambition, and they include a pop-up operation called Glasgow is Our Business, which will soon launch some high-profile messaging featuring CEOs from across the economy from finance to tech to retail to manufacturing, including companies with some of the largest supply chains around the world. It's especially important that the business voice is heard by political leaders. I said earlier that we won't solve the climate crisis without the full and sustained engagement of the private sector. Likewise, we won't solve the climate crisis without strong enabling policies, policies that provide direction, support, and incentives for the investments needed to achieve a net zero economy. Policymakers need to know that companies understand the risks and the opportunities, that the climate crisis is taken seriously in boardrooms, and that companies support the policies needed to ensure that the climate catastrophes we are enduring today don't become everyday occurrences for our children and grandchildren. Companies can help drive global climate ambition by conveying these messages to governments around the world. Here at home, President Biden's bipartisan infrastructure deal will make our power grid more reliable and ready it for the zero carbon future. It will accelerate the transition to electric vehicles. It will cap thousands of, of abandoned oil and gas wells, and it will make our communities safer and more resilient. The president's Build Back Better agenda will invest in storage, carbon capture, and other breakthrough technologies. It will provide clean energy tax incentives for consumers and companies. It will establish a clean energy standard to catalyze investment in the net zero transition. All of this will create jobs and strengthen U.S. competitiveness. These policies represent historic investments in a safer, more prosperous future investments that we can't afford to put off. 
In a matter of months, the United States has succeeded in reestablishing leadership on climate change. But when we go to Glasgow less than six weeks from now and call on other countries to do more, our leadership will count for more if we have in hand the policies we need to deliver on our promises. Calling for ambitious outcomes in Glasgow is one measure of business leadership, and we very much welcome that. Another measure of climate leadership is supporting the steps needed to ensure that those outcomes are real and lasting. In his remarks last week at the Major Economies Forum, President Biden closed by underscoring both the urgency of this moment and the tremendous opportunity before us. The time is now, he said, the time is now. We look forward to continuing to work with all of you on the road to Glasgow and beyond. Thanks again for the opportunity to join you today. Elliot, I can't thank you enough for joining us here. I think you really set the right tone for the conversation we want to have. And just want to extend to you my thanks and to that and to your team for your willingness to, to work with us and engage with us. So good luck and we, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks, Marty. Next, we'll be turning to Neil Bradley, the Chief Policy Officer and Executive Vice President of the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. Hello. Thank you, Marty. You know, I think Elliot said it best. We're not going to get where we need to go or achieve our goals when it comes to climate policy without the leadership of the private sector, without the engagement of the business community. The good news is, is that virtually every sector that you look at today, you see businesses leading, working to reduce their own emissions, to increase resiliency and sustainability. One of those sectors happens to be the finance sector. They're not unique in their commitment uh, to addressing climate change, but they're unique in their reach and they help all other sectors manage their energy transition, which is why today I'm honored uh, to spend a little time with Karen Fang, the head of global sustainable finance at Bank of America. Karen, welcome. Thank you very much for having me. So uh, you and your team at Bank of America, you, you're enablers, right? You, you make a lot of the other things that we're talking about today possible. I'm hoping you'll spend just a few moments talking a little bit about your role and the role that you see for Bank of America when it comes to climate change and sustainable finance. Absolutely. So um, I've been with the bank for 11 years. I was running a lot of sales and trading and structure financing businesses at Bank of America. One of my favorite things to do in my prior decade at Bank of America was finance wind and solar and energy efficiency projects, which led to my current role today, which uh, our chairman and CEO, Brian Moynihan, and our vice chair, Anne Finucan, set it up about a year and a half ago to run this for the entire company across our A lines of business and globally. So what we wanted to do is from a year and a half ago to send a very strong top-down message from the C-suite to the entire company that sustainable finance is in our DNA. We have to do this consistently. We have to do this strategically. Climate change, as you know, Elliot and, and, and you all talked about, is is really here and it's very visible to everyone around the globe. It's not a political issue. We see this, we have a transition to do. And the finance sector, as you mentioned, has a tremendous amount of responsibility to play because we do, every, every, you know, every project does run on capital. Every investor, company, organization does need capital to, to run. So we have a tremendous amount of responsibility to actually ensure this energy transition is done in a very sustainable manner. And we're taking into account climate equity and, and environmental justice and do it the right way. So this job was uh, was uh, set up about a year and a half ago. And I think a lot of companies now have this type of setup from top of the house and really kind of ingrained, get, it gets ingrained in the entire organization. You know, Karen, businesses measure things. That's, that's what we do, right? And we set goals and targets and we measure them. And, and Bank of America set a, a pretty ambitious target, 1.5 trillion, uh, as I understand it, sustainable finance. Um, you know, I'm here in Washington today. We throw trillions around uh, uh, here in DC, like it's not a meaningful number, when it really is a hugely impactful number, particularly uh, in the in the private sector. Put some context around the $1.5 trillion commitment. 
what does that practically mean? And what could we expect to see from that kind of level of commitment uh, to sustainable finance? Absolutely. So this is actually an effort that the U.S. private sector and the finance sector actually is leading in terms of putting tangible dollars behind two very crucial goals, environmental justice and social inclusion. And these two things, as we said, you know, I believe it's a new administration's goal as well to really kind of tackle climate change in a very equitable manner and really think about social inclusion and inclusive development at the same time thinking about climate change. So our $1.5 trillion was announced in April and we actually worked with Secretary Kerry. We worked with the new administration and the top six banks, including Bank America, collectively have announced six, you know, over seven trillion dollars of sustainable finance commitment divided between the environmental pillar and the social pillar, but the two being very connected uh, by 2030. So it's a 10 year goal. Uh, to put some context around it, it's really around our balance sheet financing and investing. Uh, Elliot named a lot of sectors and we can get into a little bit more details if we have time, uh, really around the mature technologies, whether it's wind, solar, energy efficiency and EV, uh, but also really devoting a tremendous amount of focus out of our total goal to emerging technologies, whether it's direct air capture and other carbon te capture technologies, whether it's sustainable aviation fuel and other transportation solutions, long duration energy storage, uh, looking at clean hydrogen being very important for the hard to abase sectors. Uh, but also doing that in a very inclusive manner. So paying attention to racial and gender equality, paying attention to healthcare, education, access to capital, inclusion, digital inclusion included. So all of those things are really kind of going into the, the thematic sectors and thinking about the number. It really comprises of our own financing and investing, but also our advisory M&A capital markets access, because every single company involved in in, uh, involved here needs access to capital markets. And as you all know, ESG capital markets is growing at a tremendous manner. We're gonna see a trillion dollar issuance in the ESG bond market alone in 2021. It's been doubling pretty much every year. So our job as a, an advisor and, and capital markets access provider is also very important. So it's really on balance sheet and off balance sheet advisory and, and access provider in terms of into capital markets. So that's in our number. Um, and I believe it's similar to the other banks as well. So, Karen, you, you mentioned some of these sectors and, you know, I'm, I'm fascinated by uh, the commitment that, that B of A and others have to the leading edge technologies, right? It's one thing to say, gosh, we can run the numbers on a, on a wind farm or a solar facility and we can look at the return on that. But we all know that we're not going to get to where we want to go in terms of our climate goals based on today's technology. And so someone has to finance that emerging technology. But of course, that's risky. How do you all think about kind of the risk reward concept uh, when it comes to particularly that emerging technology sector uh, and climate and resiliency? It's a really great question. And frankly, I think that's where it takes all of us. I do think the public sector uh, incentives uh, will help. Uh, I think Elliot mentioned some of the tax incentives and I know government is working on incentives, not just, you know, wind and solar extension EV, but also potentially looking at staff, sustainable aviation fuel uh, incentives and potentially looking at green hydrogen. Those will be obviously very welcome because the important thing is this demand signal is to drive the flywheel and, and of supply and demand and making sure economics can come, you know, can become cheaper and more competitive with conventional uh, technology and energy sources as quickly as possible. So any type of incentive obviously helps capital markets, uh, but also really we need concessionary capital and de-risking capital and, and other impact investors that have additional environmental goals in addition to the monetary goals. Um, but on that, you know, I think to your point, these emerging technologies, we need to transition very, very fast. I think what will happen in the last two and a half centuries since the industrial revolution, we need to transition all of that energy complex and, and how we consume, how we eat, how we how we move around, all of that in the next two and a half decades. So it's definitely an unprecedented pace that we are we are we are at. And I think any type of incentive from public sector, any type of movement from the private sector will be very helpful. But I do think blended finance is here to stay. And I think you, you saw some announcement that, that just came out that we are working together with Bill Gates, with Big Read Through Catalyst to actually help invest in some of these early stage technologies with concessionary capital and really advising these early stage companies and helping them mature very quickly. 
Well, Karen, we have a, about a minute left. Um, we mentioned this is on the road to, to COP26. Um, we all wish we were in person and doing these events the way we used to, uh, but, uh, but folks are listening. So what message would you have? What hopes do you have for those who are gonna gather in Glasgow? Uh, and what would you leave them with if you could give them uh, one, one bit of advice or one request? Uh, I think it's that the urgency is here. I think we all need to have a sense of urgency and we also need to take a very practical approach. Let's not let perfect be the enemy of the good. I think the evolution needs to happen. I think public and private sector need to work together. I think we all have a very, very important role to play together. So I really hope that the gathering will be what will yield some tangible areas that we can all collaborate on and making sure this pace of transition is on track. Well, well, Karen, I, I, that is a great message. Uh, thank you so much for taking time out of what I know is a very, very busy schedule to spend with us. Um, thank you for the work that you're doing and the leadership that you, your team, and really the, the whole Bank of America operation has shown uh, when it comes to, to tackling climate change. Thank you very much for having me. And it's great and look forward to working with everyone on this. Thank you all. Thank you. So finance has an important role, as we just learned from Karen, in making these projects a reality. Uh, but it takes businesses and industrial sectors to put that technology to use, to figure out their own plan for emissions reductions and climate resiliency, uh, and to access that financing and make big bets uh, on the future. Uh, today, uh, we're going to have a discussion with two companies, two leaders, uh, who are making those kind of big bets and are making a difference. I'm pleased to be joined by Rich Vorberg, President of Siemens Energy, North America, and Catherine Neby, Chief, Sustainable, Chief Sustainability Officer for Duke Energy. Welcome to you both. Thank you. So uh, the, the title of uh, this session is Leading by Example. Uh, and as I just alluded to, both of your companies are doing just that. You've made major commitments when it comes to emissions reductions. And I hope you'll share with the audience a little bit about what drove uh, those commitments and how you're moving forward on them. Uh, and so, Rich, let's uh, let's start with you. Uh, what's what's Siemens doing? Why are you doing it? And how is it going? Well, thanks, Neil, and uh, really excited to be here and uh, be joining Catherine as well. A uh, little bit about Siemens Energy first. We're a company. Uh, we're a global company, about ninety thousand people on the president of North America. We've got about 12,000 people in our group. And uh, and actually, as you can see behind me, I'm not in my uh, regular office. I'm in uh, Dubai, just got off a, off a plane here in Dubai for a workshop. And, and really a lot of our focus as a company is figuring out how to manage this energy transition. We've been transitioning for a while and now it's really starting to take hold. And that's our top priority. So we as Siemens, we've committed already to be by 2023, we'll be 100% uh, running on green energy. So all our all our factories, all our offices will be using 100% green energy. And we'll be climate neutral by 2030. That's uh, quite a challenge. Uh, you know, and when you look at uh, uh, the people in our industry, a lot of them are, are later than that. We, we said we've got to be advanced and we've got to you got to walk the walk and talk the talk. So we said by 2030, we want to be climate neutral. And we're well on that way. Um, you know, if you look at what we've done over the last year, we've, we've exited the coal, uh, new unit coal business. We will no longer supply uh, new units to coal. Um, and then you look at the portfolio that we've got. So our uh, turbines, uh, a lot of them already, or, or a couple of them can already burn up to 50%. Many already at 30% and by 2030, we'll be at 100% that all our units can burn 100% hydrogen. And then you look at the transmission side of our business, uh, reducing and, and eliminating the SF gases, which cause green, which are part of, it, of a, a greenhouse gas as well. And then the exciting new part of our business is the electrolyzers. An electrolyzer makes the hydrogen. So it takes that green energy off off the grid and creates hydrogen. 
splits, splits uh, the water apart into hydrogen and oxygen and creates 100% green hydrogen. And then put on top of that is our Siemens Gamesa ownership. We own two thirds of Siemens Gamesa and they're the leaders, in, one of the leaders in the onshore and offshore wind turbine. But it, it, it's really about the partnering and that that's, we can't do it alone as, as Siemens Energy and we've got to do it as a, as a partnership. So it's it's collaborating, collaborating with government, collaborating with, with uh, our customers and our customers like Duke, we're really excited uh, to have a, a, a number of partnerships uh, that we're doing and we'll talk a little bit more of that in uh, a few minutes here. But uh, what we had is a lot of our customers signed up in 2018 for to be decarbonized by 2050. And uh, they said, how do we do this? And we said, we're learning that as well. And we created a decarbonization roadmap, which uh, a radar, which then can help customers create their own journey to become decarbonized. So we've got to be partners with our company, with our customers and with the other companies to help them create a roadmap to become decarbonized. So Catherine, I want to get you in on this. I mean, you're, you're an energy company and you all have made some really significant commitments. Um, what are those commitments? What drove them and how's it going? Yeah, well, thanks for having me here. Always a pleasure to speak at Climate Week um, and, and just be part of the conversation about how we're moving to forward to address climate change. Um, uh, Duke Energy, I, it's one of the coolest things that I get to say uh, as a Chief Sustainability Officer, uh, we, we get to say that our climate strategy is our, our business strategy, um, with, which is specifically to get to net zero uh, by 2050. And we have been well on our way for over a decade. We've already achieved over 40% of uh, carbon emissions reductions uh, since 2005. Uh, and we're also overseeing one of the largest uh, coal retirements across our industry. And um, I, I joined Duke a little over a year ago, just slightly over a year ago, because this is a company that, that uh, has the opportunity to make a real difference and a real positive impact on an issue that, that keeps me up at night and that I'm excited by, which is, which is climate change. Um, specifically how we're going to get there. Uh, we're going to double the amount of renewables on the energy system, on our energy system by 2025, and then triple them by 2030. We're also looking at uh, storage and, and scaling that up really quickly so that we can really complement those renewables. Uh, and then in terms of keeping energy reliable and affordable, affordable, I mean, we certainly cannot lose sight of our customers and those who rely upon uh, energy and electricity to power their homes, to, power their, to run their businesses. So the, the important role that nuclear plays in that, um, in that uh, equation and in that conversation. And then of course, as the energy system transforms, how we bring gas on, on board from a dispatchable standpoint to ensure that we're able to maintain uh, the reliability and transition out of coal quickly and also think through how we're, how we're supporting renewable technologies. So. Uh, it's a really exciting time to be in the energy sector. This is this is a field that is evolving so quickly, that is transforming at kind of lightning pace, um, and is doing work that I think really truly um, um, moves the needle forward with respect to climate. So really excited to be here and share more. Well, let's dive into some of this a little bit. So, um, you know, in the last segment with Karen, we talked about the, the, the traditional technologies. Um, that weren't traditional maybe 10 years ago, but now we kind of think of, and these kind of cutting edge technologies. I think it's uh, the IEA who estimates that 45% of the needed uh, emissions reductions are gonna have to come from technologies that aren't commercially scalable today. But you guys run commercial operations. You have to find things to scale. You have to be looking around the corner for what's coming next. And so, you know, Catherine, as you look at kind of the landscape and what you see out there, are there particular technologies uh, that you're excited about? Or have some of those investments maybe in those technologies that Duke has made uh, created some unique partnerships? How are you thinking about kind of that investment on the cutting edge side? Yeah, well, we have really clear line of sight for the next decade, decade plus in terms of how we're going to drive down uh, our overall emissions. But but as the energy system evolves, as the grid changes, just given the diverse energy mix, we know that we're going to need what we call zero emission, 
zero emissions load following resources to bring them to scale, uh, to utility scale. Uh, and since this is an industry that likes an acronym, uh, we refer to them as, as ZELFERS. And so these ZELFER technologies provide us with the flexibility over time to really respond to the energy needs uh, that are, are underway in our community kind of in a, in a, in a moment's uh, notice. Um, and the, the more quickly we can bring these technologies forward and, and, and bring them to a level where we're, we're piloting them, we're developing them, we're demonstrating them, we're proving them out, we're bringing them to scale and commercializing them, I think the better off we will all be. So I'm really excited to see how, this, how these new technologies really um, play a significant role in the transformation that's to come. Uh, the Zelfer technologies that we're looking at include things like advanced nuclear, carbon capture, uh, hydrogen, and other other uh, gases, and of course, long duration um, storage. And so, I think there are a lot of folks uh, across the energy system and more energy system and more broadly um, who are looking at these technologies and, and are kind of placing their bets on where these these technologies are going to emerge. Um, but I think at Duke, we're really, really working on proving them out, working with partners to try and understand how are they going to work um, kind of in, in the real world. Uh, so within industry, we're working with uh, EPRI and GTI on a low carbon resource initiative or an anchor sponsor of that, that effort. And that's really looking at what are the, how can we research the technologies that are needed for these low carbon, this low carbon future. Uh, we're also working with EEI and a consortium of NGOs on a carbon-free technology initiative. We're one of the founding members of that. And, and here we're not just looking at what are the technologies and where are they poised to go and what, what's kind of capable, we're, but we're also looking at, importantly, what are the policy mechanisms that we'll need in place to ensure that, that we can bring the system into the energy system just, just as quickly as possible. And of course, we're piloting some of these technologies in, in real time. Hydrogen is a great example where we're working with Siemens and Clemson uh, through a Department of Energy award to try and understand how hydrogen can serve as, as an energy storage um, option and also a, a low car a, 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 um, a low carbon uh, fuel source. Uh, and then we're also working with Moniz's uh, Energy Futures Initiative. So looking at hydrogen again, looking at a case study across the Carolinas for how the Carolinas can serve as essentially a hub for, for uh, green hydrogen. So a lot of exciting work that's happening in terms of coming together and understanding what are the enabling environments, what are those technologies um, that we see in the future, and then also critically, let's, let's do some real world um, testing to understand how they're playing themselves out uh, in the world today and where they can go. So, so Rich, you you talked about some of the green hydrogen earlier, uh, but I'm curious, uh, what what are your Zephyr? I'm going to confuse this. I love the Zephyr. What what, what are your Zephyr technologies that that you're focused on there in Siemens? Yeah, no, I, and I love that word too. I was actually just on a uh, call with Duke about an hour ago, and they were talking about their Zephyr technology, and uh, that's a new a new one that I had to say. Remind me again what that means, but. Uh, you know, I, I look at uh, what we're doing as Siemens Energy, and we're, we are doing our part. We uh, we spend about a, a $1.2 billion a year in R&D, and we're doing that, and a lot of that money is focused on energy improvements, on uh, emissions reductions, uh, and, and around new technologies. So that hydrogen is really exciting. But the biggest problem we've got with hydrogen is keeping it, or is getting it to an economic uh, scale. Today, it's very difficult uh, with the cost of the hydrogen to, uh, to make it economic. And if we really want to make this sustainable, we've got to make it economic. And, and that's what we as Siemens are doing. We're accelerating that scale. We're, we're getting it in the ground, we're getting it operational, and we're going to grow it. And we're going to grow it to the point where it becomes uh, economic. And uh, when, you know, last week or the week before last, I was on a uh, DOE uh, as a panelist, and that was on the hydrogen shot. So the the uh, DOE has challenged us, similar to Kennedy's moonshot, they did the hydrogen shot. One dollar for one kilo within a decade. Now that's quite a challenge, considering we're probably five, six times that today. So we really need to do it, and we can't do it as alone. Alone, as we said, we need the government, we need academia, we need uh, you know different trade groups, and we need our customers. And uh, as Catherine talked about the Clemson side, I'm really excited about that. I sit on uh, the board with Clemson, with Duke, 
and with Siemens Energy. And the three of us are really working together, taking existing infrastructure and, and figuring out how to get hydrogen into that in existing infrastructure. And that's the important part is that that's the quick way to market. That's the quickest way so that we don't have to uh, strand old assets, but we can utilize the existing assets that they have. And in place of natural gas, we burn or we, we blend initially and then eventually we go to 100% hydrogen burning in one of our gas turbines. And with that, then that also goes out to uh, the district heating for, for uh, the Clemson University. So exciting stuff that we're doing, and but but again, we we're all doing great things, but we can't do it alone. We've got we can't do it in a vacuum. We've all got to work together. We've got to look globally. Uh, we as Siemens are 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 doing this in various parts of the world, and, and we're we're taking that learning and we're bringing it back to the U.S. And, and and we're taking what we have in the U.S. what we're learning and spreading that globally as well. Because that's the important part is uh, we're, we're in a, a global world and emissions is a global problem. So we, we just can't solve it in the US. We've got to solve it globally. And when we work together as partners, that's how we're gonna decarbonize the entire world. So um, we have a little less than two minutes left. So we're gonna go lightning round here. Um, everyone who's spoken so far today, and thank you both for joining us, uh, has mentioned that uh, we can't do it alone, right? That there's gotta be uh, private sector uh, leadership and there's gotta be public sector leadership. And part of that public sector leadership is obviously the, the legislation that's pending on the hill, this infrastructure package by the US Chambers Count. There's about a hundred billion dollars in investment uh, related to climate and, and, and energy. I know both of you all and your teams have kind of looked at that. Is there anything that excites you about uh, this infrastructure package and what could be invested? In? And Catherine, we'll let, we'll let you go first. Yeah, I'll be I'll be brief. There's, there's a lot to like uh, in the package. Uh, we're big supporters um, of the bipartisan infrastructure uh, legislation because it, it does provide the the funding that is so critical to bring these technologies to scale. Um, and I, I've worked in climate for over 20 years, and, and I like to say the best you know, thing to invest in was something 20 years ago. The next best thing is the investment that you're making today to drive down emissions and to uh, evolve the grid forward to, to clean energy. I think transmission is something that I'm really excited about because I foolishly, before I joined the sector, thought it was about just building the generation, but now it's about getting that, that generation to, to the demand. Um, I, I'm also very excited about the EV build out and then also some of those next generation uh, technologies that have been identified, uh, both of which I think need, need a lot of um, attention, support and investment to bring to scale. Excellent. Rich, what, what excites you about the package? All right, I'll, I'll try to be brief because that's not in my nature, but I'll do my best. So first of all, thanks for the Chamber's uh, leadership on this bill as well. It, we, we are very much in favor of it as well. And, and the things that excite us, nuclear energy, uh, Catherine mentioned it earlier, the support of nuclear energy is zero emission energy source. The four hydrogen hubs, $8 billion are, are set aside for that. And then also the cybersecurity. Uh, that's an important part of, of making this sustainable. And then lastly, the, the $10 billion in grid investments. Very important to make sure that we get a good solid grid to get the renewables from where they're generated to uh, the electricity from where they're being generated to where it's being needed. And without a good solid grid, none of that can happen. So there's a lot to be excited for in this bill, and uh, we support it. And we really appreciate the chamber and Duke's support of this bill as well. Well, I want to thank you both. Um, uh, sadly, we're at time. I think we could go on quite a bit longer because there is a lot to like and there is a lot going on. So Catherine, Rich, thank you both uh, for joining us today. And thank you for Siemens and Duke's leadership uh, as we tackle this, this global problem. So uh, thank you all. I'm now pleased to turn it back over uh, to my colleague, Marty Durbin. Marty. Thank you, Neil, for those great conversations with Karen, Rich, and, and Catherine. I'm pleased to now be joined by Mary Draves, Chief Sustainability Officer and Vice President for EHNS, the Dow Chemical Company 
and Glenn Wright, Vice President for Renewables and Energy Solutions within the Americas with Shell. First of all, great to see both of you again, and thank you for joining us this afternoon. Hey. Pleasure to be here. Thank you, Marty. Yeah, pleasure to be here, Marty. Thank you very much. You bet. And well, I'd like to ask each of you to kind of open with the big picture description of your company's overall philosophy and approach to climate sustainability issues and kind of how that's evolved in recent years. Uh, Mary, why don't we begin with you? Okay, great. Marty, thanks. And, you know, it's a pleasure to be back again talking about, you know, climate, I think one of our most pressing challenges. And it's been excellent to hear my other colleagues uh, talk to many issues that we're all very, very engaged in. in. So, you know, Dow's commitment to sustainability really is a, is a key part of our ambition. You know, we've, we've been, we are striving to be the most innovative, customer-centric, inclusive, and sustainable material science company in the world. You know, in the, in the past year and a half, I think for all of us have posed a number of challenges, a global pandemic, for us in Midland, a flood in our hometown, and then a winter storm freeze in the Gulf Coast. And I think those the, that list continues to grow. You know, we've, however, continued to advance that ambition as a strategic driver of our long-term value for Dow and in for all of our stakeholders. So last year, Dow introduced additional sustainability targets to address climate and plastic waste in addition to our ambitious 2025 sustainability goals. I mean, a, a set of goals that we've had for almost a decade. You know, our climate target aims to reduce Dow's net carbon emissions by 15 percent um, by 2030 and then also achieve carbon neutrality by 2050. And we believe, you know, these are both the both circularity and climate are catalysts for growth and innovation, which are very important pieces uh, to solving these challenges. You know, widespread support for decarbonizing emission is driving demand across the value chain. And, you know, Dow is well placed to continue to lead in this evolution. You know, many of Dow's products lower our customers' emissions more than the carbon emissions used to produce them, you know, enabling lighter, safer, fuel-efficient vehicles, um, more energy-efficient buildings, and food that stays safe and fresher lots longer, you know, all critical to a world that we see potentially adding 2 billion people by 2050. You know, our pathway to carbon neutrality really is focused on three key elements targeting further efficiencies and optimization at our sites, sourcing renewable energy and clean power, and then implementing new emission management technologies. Our operations are already exceedingly efficient. We, we continue to work to optimize the energy efficiency at our sites. We're using renewables to lower our emissions and, foc and our focus is to find solutions that enable us to balance affordability, reliability, and environmental sustainability. And of course, we're also using our 125 years of material science expertise to implement transitional manufacturing technologies in our plants, which reduce energy use and greenhouse gas emissions. And we're also developing breakthrough technologies, that innovation piece, electric ethylene steam crackers, carbon capture and sequestration, and then also the use of blue hydrogen, which Dow could be among the first in the industry to do so closer to the end of the decade. So, you know, at Dow, we see the role of business as a catalyst for change, a driver of innovation that protects the environment while also creating growth for society. Thanks, Mary. Well, well Glenn Shell certainly has taken a very public uh, position, a forward leaning position on, on climate sustainability. So uh, let me ask you how the, how, how the company came to that approach. Thank you, Marty. So at Shell, we power progress together by providing more and cleaner energy solutions. That's fundamentally how we think about it. That's Shell's role in society. Uh, it is a strategy that's based on a set of ambitious but attainable goals. Um, one of those goals, for instance, is achieving net zero emissions by 2050 or sooner. We power lives. We respect nature. And of course, it's incumbent upon all of us at Shell to deliver shareholder value in the process. And, uh, now, delivering on our commitments uh, those occur, that delivery occurs in a number of ways. Uh, first of all, our aim is that we address scope one, two, and three emissions. And if you think about Shell, well, 85 to 90% of our emissions uh, are based on the products that we sell. So we work very closely, we partner with our customers to help them on their decarbonization journey as well. And we do this in three wells, in three ways. Number one, we focus on avoiding emissions. And where possible, we help our customers as we think about HVAC efficiency improvements or lighting improvements. Those are uh, our techniques that we use. But where we can't necessarily approach efficiency gains, then we also look at reducing emissions. And we reduce those emissions by changing the energy mix. 
For this reason, we are very dedicated to investments in wind, offshore and onshore, solar, battery storage, of course. We also look at hydro. Uh, in addition, we're focused on biofuels and, um, and hydrogen, of course. Green hydrogen is another focus area for us as we think about our future and how we engage with the customer. So changing the energy mix is another way. And lastly, where possible, we work in those areas that are hard to decarbonize, we, fo we focus on mitigating. And that mitigation comes in the form of technology through CCS technology or through nature-based solutions. Nature-based solutions are a key way because nature is one of the key sinks for carbon. So these are all very important ways that we address the challenge. Now, we attach our a compensation for our employees to our performance in these areas. So we're very serious. It requires behavioral changes within the organization, but it also requires behavioral changes um, from our customers and society at large. We're excited about the ability to progress together uh, by delivering more and cleaner energy solutions. Excellent. Thank you, Glenn. Well, you know, we've heard a lot of conversation this morning about the, the role of innovation and technology. And there's no question, as we've said, there's 45% you know, of, the of the technologies that we're going to need to meet these ambitious global goals aren't, aren't yet commercially available. But not, not to make this about the future and the past, but about, you know, what we need today. Mary, let me start with you. You know, your boss, Dow CEO Jim Fitterling, made a strong case for why we need to proceed carefully with the energy transition and why affordable natural gas and related infrastructure is so important as we pursue a net zero future. Uh, you know, Europe is currently dealing with record high natural gas prices and even you know, threatens, that could you know, end up threatening energy security and reliability. So how do we strike the right balance and how does Dow view the potential of natural gas to reduce emissions and meet environmental goals? Yeah, Marty, I think it's no secret um, that the boom of shale gas in the U.S. has driven emission reductions by switching, you know, from coal to natural gas. You know, as well, it's created this competitive advantage for, for the U.S., right? There's there's no one silver bullet. We've heard that, you know, from others. Um, and we all need technologies uh, working and working together to really achieve carbon neutrality. Um, so there will be different paths and much will depend on the availability um, of technologies and existing resources in each geography. You know, we've looked at scenarios and studies from International Energy uh, Association, as well as many others, that show that natural gas has to be part of that solution. You know, for companies like Dow, um, natural gas is not only a fuel, it's also one of our main feedstocks, you know, a key raw material um, for our processes. So, you know, as a feedstock, it's not emitted and, and it doesn't contribute to, to climate change. But, you know, natural gas as a feedstock is transformed into a product, really into a solution like the ones that um, we've mentioned and others have talked to that help decarbonize the world, light weighting of vehicles, um, you know, uh, building uh, infrastructure. So natural gas will keep serving as an important base load that will guarantee uh, security and reliability while also the deployment of other clean car carbon technologies occur. You know, so having said that, we believe that carbon capture and storage and use is gonna be critical to ensure that natural gas is part of that solution you know, either to make blue hydrogen or to enable a decarbonization of existing manufacturing facilities that still have a long lifespan. Um, you know, we've just announced a, a partnership with Houston in Houston with 11 other companies to support that large scale development of CCS in that region. Um, and these efforts could capture and store, you know, 50 million metric tons of CO2 by 2030 and 100 million by 2040. Excellent. Uh, thanks, Mary. Glenn, I want to bring you this in, in on this as well. You know, climate state stakeholders have varying views on natural gas. There's an ongoing debate over how it should best fit into the energy transition. So can you provide us with, with Shell's perspective on the potential for natural gas to reduce emissions around the world by displacing other energy sources and as well as, you know, your efforts to you know, address upstream emissions of methane and elsewhere through the supply chain? Absolutely. And thanks for the opportunity to do so. We, see, we too see natural gas as just fundamental to the energy transition. We've made tremendous efforts to change our portfolio over time to the cleanest burning of all uh, natural resources or, or, or fossil fuels. It is far and away the cleanest among them. And to this end, it's important. As we think about transitioning with more wind and solar, as an example, we know that these are intermittent resources. They cannot be dispatched. And as such, we need other sources. Now, battery technology is coming along and certainly it will improve with time. And in due course, it will play a bigger and bigger role. But today, uh, that, that bridge, if you will, that allows us to firm 
a delivery of power is combined cycle or natural gas or, or, or fat, flexible fast start generation, which is fired again, fueled by natural gas. It's important to, to the overall uh, approach that we take. Now, having said all of that, you know, uh, to the points made earlier, uh, we, we, we do imagine that that will be a bigger part of the portfolio. As I said, we're shifting even now. We're big, we're a huge player in natural gas, we're a huge player in LNG. And as such, we see this as a mechanism to continue to provide energy. Ultimately, we have an obligation. We have a fundamental obligation to supply energy to the world, and it's a part of the mix. As I said earlier, you know, if you think broadly about where we're going over time, in 50 years' time, it could well be that electricity is delivering 50% of energy use, um, which means that today is about 20%, which implies that it's going to increase by four or five times over that horizon. It also suggests that other fuel sources will continue to play a role. And we see that evolving with things like hydrogen and biofuels. But again, natural gas is likely to be a very significant part of that solution as well, because we still need dense energy carriers. And so we see it as extremely important. Great. That's a really helpful perspective. So both of your companies are multinational companies with operations all around the world. And you've obviously got experience uh, working on climate issues across a variety of, uh, of national governments. So with that perspective in mind, I'd like to ask each of you to share your views on climate as a global issue. In other words, as we get closer to COP26 and we see both businesses and countries across the world increasing their ambition, new commitments to clean energy and reduce emissions, I mean, what messages would your companies have for the government's delegates and others that are going to be there in Glasgow? Uh, Glenn, why don't I start with you this time? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think first and foremost, Shell supports bold action on climate. We think it's fundamental. But, you know, clearly this can't happen piecemeal. We need to take a sectoral approach to public and private collaboration. That's key for us. So as we look ahead to COP26, it's clear that the world is not moving fast enough. We believe that countries and indeed uh, that countries and industry need to pursue a series of international sectoral decarbonization agreements to address energy use along, um, alongside energy supply. Um, fundamentally, we, we support clearly Paris, uh, which was uh, COP21, um, but more needs to be done if we are to achieve and to avoid uh, temperature rise above 1.5 degrees C. We need more action, we need more cooperation. It needs to be a more concerted effort. Excellent, thank you. Mary? Yeah, you know, Marty, I think Dow has always been a supporter of the Kyoto Protocol, the Paris Agreement, the Montreal Protocol. Um, you know, climate change is already causing more frequent and severe weather events across the world today than we've ever seen. And I think many of, them, many of us have experienced them um, firsthand. You know, as some of our other colleagues earlier on, climate doesn't know borders or languages. You know, no company, no country can do really anything alone. It's This is about us working together. And only by working together can we solve this most challenging, you know, frankly, crisis we're facing. You know, that's why the expectations at Glasgow, I think, are very high, since it's the world's best hope to secure ambitious commitments uh, to do what the science tells us we must do and turn the tide on climate change. And we all have a role to play. You know, having said that, we need, to, we need country leaders to come together at the Conference of the Parties to finalize the Paris rulebook. The rulebook is, is really crucial to unleashing several solutions, among them the creation of global carbon markets. You know, studies have shown that the efficiency and benefits of having in place a global carbon marketplace that will allow us to meet international re reduction commitments. We need to have clear rules of accounting, auditing, and transfer emission reduction credits among countries. Another key element that needs to be defined at COP26 is, is how the international community will mobilize the much required climate financing with transparency and accountability. We, the private sector and Dow are doing our part. You know, as I said before, we see the role of business as a catalyst for change. Each of us can bring about the change by driving innovation that protects the environment while also creating growth for society. You know, as Dow is committed to achieving carbon neutrality by 2050 as, as many of our peers, you know, for years, we've been the leaders among the chemical industry and the use of clean energy and have currently secured over 850 megawatts of renewable power to use at Dow sites around the world. We're investing R &D in R&D for decarbonization, and we have a partnership with Shell to develop an electrified cracker. You know, as well as we're working on different strategies to reduce our emissions, you know, we're planning to be at Glasgow as part of our advocacy efforts, and we intend to be one of the many constructive voices that will make it a successful COP. 
Well, Mary, Glenn, let me thank you both for joining us today. You were really important voices to focus not on just what the business community is doing in this space, but the importance of the partnerships we need with our government, uh, government partners and our supply chains uh, uh, in all directions. So again, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you, Marty. Well, welcome back, and then we've got our, our final <clears throat> final session here. I want to welcome uh, Warwick King, Vice President for Low Carbon Initiatives with ConocoPhillips, and Sharon Tomp Tompkins, who's the Vice President for Sustainability at Sempra. Thank you both for being with us today. Nice to be here. So let's let's start just as we did with the last panel. I'd like to get kind of the big picture perspective uh, from both of your companies uh, on you know, about how your overall philosophy on an approach to climate and sustainability issues. I know these are very important to both of your companies, and there's been a lot of activity in, in this space in recent years. Uh, so perhaps you can also describe some of the specific emissions targets related to your company's operations and how you're going about meeting them. So let's Jennifer, let's begin with you. Is that me, Sharon? I'm sorry, Sharon. Oh, yes, no Sharon. I did mean Sharon. <laughs> I, I could be a Jennifer for the day. No, please uh, don't. We'll keep things uh, with Sharon. <laughs> uh, I, I'm uh, really delighted to be here today to share um, Semper's vision to net zero by 2050. Uh, sustainability has been in Semper's DNA since the formation of Semper in 1998. We have focused on creating resilient operations and sustainable value creation. We have deep roots in the regulated California markets, and it has allowed us since our, set, our inception to manage environmental, social, and governance risks and opportunities as integral to the part of our business. In fact, uh, our 2020 sustainability report is our 13th report. Every day, we at Sempra deliver energy to more than 36 million consumers. Our infrastructure is helping to create clean, resilient energy systems that are reliable and affordable. And this last point I think is incredibly important. Creating a clean or net zero energy system is critically important, but if it is not also resilient, reliable and affordable, I think we've ultimately failed. We believe that we have a tremendous opportunity to help influence the net zero energy systems of 2050. Semper's infrastructure serves some of the world's largest economies, California, Texas, and Mexico. And we're delivering some of the largest amounts of renewable energy. And in fact, in California, we've been out of coal for over uh, since I think it was 20, 2005. In Texas, we're connecting 40, 2% of wind generation capacity to the grid. And in California, we deliver 40% of electricity from renewable sy systems or sources at SDG&E. And at SoCal Gas, we've committed uh, by 2030 to have 20% renewable gases included in our core load by 2030 and are on target to meeting the 5% goal that we set for 2022. But we're not uh, just a uh, energy infrastructure here in America. Globally, we are helping to advance energy systems in the developing economies through a lit liquefied natural gas infrastructure, uh, helping to provide grid support for lower carbon energy systems as they are be being developed in these economies. This gives us, I think, a unique perspective, both local and global, and because we have to deliver to the Americas, uh, electricity the, um, that, that, that basically is a, uh, there's no off switch. We must be able to safely and reliably deliver this energy 24 hours a day, 365 days. So that's really that local view. We also have more than 20 global customers who rely on us delivering energy that's enabling the diversification of those energy systems. This macro level and micro level really helps us to understand what will be needed to create a net zero energy system that will be needed by mid-century. 
And our journey to net zero uh, began decades ago, as I mentioned about the uh, 2005 uh, being out of coal. Uh, we've been advancing that net zero, but setting the goal is the vision. And our vision is to be net zero across all three scopes by 2050. We must also be able to achieve that goal. So when we were thinking about setting our net zero goal, we really wanted to think about it from an investment thesis perspective. What are the investments that we will need to make in the next 30 years to achieve our net zero goal? And we came up with three uh, areas of investment, decarbonization, diversification, and digitalization, what we've referred to the three Ds. We are working to bring lower to zero carbon fuel sources to every market as part of our diversification efforts. Um, examples, the LNG export microgrids and hydrogen products projects. And through the U.S. utility business, we are driving progress to more sustainable energy ecosystems through clean electrons and clean molecules, including advancing clean molecules such as hydrogen and working transition the transportation sector through electric vehicles and clean fuel infrastructure. Today, we have more than 10 hydrogen projects and demonstration projects underway in California, uh, and in partnership with organizations like the National Renewable Energy Lab. And through digitalization, we aim to improve the operational efficiency, safety, and service to achieve the integration of real-time information and cutting-edge analytics benefiting networks and operations. We are focused on machine learning, AI, smart grids, and satellite methane to create that energy system of 2050 that's going to be needed. Great, thank you, Sharon. That's a very, very helpful perspective. Um, Warwick, I've had the, you know, the the pleasure of being able to watch and work with uh, Conoco Phillips over a number of years, and it's been kind of exciting to watch the evolution of both the sector and the company. So, uh, let me ask the same question for you on how on, on how how Conoco Phillips is approaching the overall climate sustainability, uh, you know, challenges and opportunities today. I think you're on mute. I am, thank you. There we go. Uh, well, thanks, Marty, and thanks for having us on the panel today. Um, uh, we've been thinking about how to address climate-related risk uh, for a long time. I think it was back to 2003 we published our first climate change position statement. And I think that's continued to be reflected in our current business strategy. Uh, I think last October, as we looked to refresh our climate risk strategy, uh, it was a major moment for ConocoPhillips when we became the first US-based oil and gas company to adopt a Paris-aligned climate risk strategy. And at the same time, we stated our ambition to be net zero by 2050. Um, as I think about it, I think our climate risk framework is both, it's ambitious and credible. Um, to us, there's, there's no real debate about what ESG leadership requires. Uh, I think if you read our wording, you'll find we call it our triple mandate, uh, which ensures that everything we do is aligned to the underlying realities of our business. I mean, first and foremost, we must continue to meet demand on any transition pathway. And that's done through the most disciplined capital allocation and strongest execution in the business. We must deliver consistent and compelling returns on and off capital. And finally, we must achieve our net zero ambitions for all of our operational emissions. We embrace this mandate because we believe there's a valuable role for a company like ours in the energy transition. Combined with our focus on developing the lowest cost of supply resources, we believe our climate risk framework is the most effective way for our company to sustainably contribute to society's transition to a lower carbon economy. Uh, you may have seen that yesterday we announced we will improve our scope one and scope two greenhouse gas emission intensity reduction targets. Uh, uh, earlier this year, our, our 2030 target was 35 to 45% on a gross operated basis. We've increased that to 40 to 50% on both a net equity and gross operated basis based off a 2016 baseline. You know, as we look to our journey to net zero, I think this revised targets give us a tangible interim step. You asked for some other metrics. I think other ones that are key out there, we're very much focused on putting near-term targets to achieve zero routine flaring uh, in the near term and further reduce our methane emission intensity. Our target is to reduce it by a further 10% uh, by 2025, and that's in addition to the 65% reduction in intensity that we've achieved since 2015. Um, maybe a couple of final points with regard to scope three emissions, uh, end use emissions. 
Uh, we've been advocating for some time now for a US price, and we do that through our Climate Leadership Council. And as several people have spoken before, uh, my team's evaluating low carbon opportunities and technologies that can closely integrate with our global operations, markets, and core competencies. So again, very active in this space from both an emission reduction uh, and from a low carbon opportunities perspective. Great. Well, so I know both of your companies have been investing heavily in a variety of new low carbon technology solutions. And while there isn't time to go through all of them, I'd love if each of you, and we'll start with you, Sharon, tell us about one or two of those technology areas that you're personally most excited about and any kind of major challenges or obstacles that uh, you think need to be overcome in order for you to, uh, you know, to bring that those technology to, to fruition. Um, I think uh, We've heard a, a little bit about um, several of them in, in cup of, a couple of the other speakers, but I think areas that we're particularly interested in is really creating those green energy molecules, that clean molecules that work in tandem with our, um, our, our electrons to create that reliable, resilient, clean energy system that I talked about in 2050. And so to do that, um, we're really looking to advance some technologies that um, are, are proving to be promising um, on the green gas side. Uh, there's renewable natural gas. And as I indicated, we have committed to having 20% run through our system here in uh, Southern California by 2050. Um, but we're also looking at hydrogen. The one thing that we know about renewable electricity is ultimately um, if the wind isn't blowing and the sun isn't shining, we're not going to have that resilient, reliable energy system that we need. And so finding those um, those technologies and advancing those technologies so that we have that reliable grid that we take for granted today is going to be critically important. And so we are advancing and have 10 uh, pilot projects, uh, projects at um, uh, on the hydrogen front where we're really advancing that clean hydrogen, um, both as a storage. I think one of the really uh, great things that we have here in the United States is a really um, vast uh, natural gas infrastructure and really leveraging that infrastructure to be able to store the sun and the wind for when it's needed, I think is going to be critically important. And so that's one area that is a part of our 3Ds. Um, and, and, and so um, I think that's one of the particular technologies that we are looking to advance, as well as being able to store um, uh, carbon longer term. Uh, Excellent. Well, thank you. Warwick, uh, what are the technologies that, uh, that you and ConocoPhillips are most excited about? Okay, so uh, earlier this year, we formed a dedicated low carbon team uh, that had two primary uh, focuses. The first, obviously, is to be the stewards of our, net, uh, our, our journey to net zero. So we're working with each of our business units globally to identify, prioritize, and execute operational emission reduction initiatives. And I'll give a couple of examples of those in a minute. Um, secondly, I say we're also evaluating developing business opportunities for the energy transition. Probably not surprisingly, as several other people have spoken about uh, today, uh, you know, we're focusing on areas that we believe complement our core competencies. So key areas that we're looking at are carbon capture, utilization storage, uh, and hydrogen, both blue and green. Uh, we're also quite heavily involved in looking at offset businesses, and we believe they will be key to some of the harder to abate emissions. Um, on the emission reduction front, uh, I think this year we've done over 50 emission reduction projects. Um, uh, and next year, that'll probably probably go to 75 to 80 about half of these projects are probably economic in their own right. The other half are primarily pilots and trials, which we believe with technological breakthroughs will have the potential to be economic over time, particularly uh, if there's a price on carbon. But so let me give you a couple of examples from our global portfolio. I'll start in the lower 48 uh, in our back in operations. Uh, here they're working on several projects to aim at reducing routine flaring and that really is all in service of us helping to meet the World Bank's zero routine flaring. Uh, their target's 2030, but our ambition is to be there by 25. I mean, a lot of these are smaller projects, uh, includes removing barriers that limit our ability to process associated gas. So this can be vapor recovery units that allow us to uh, produce gas from three-phase separators. 
Uh, we started to use some mobile recovery units to take flare gas and convert it into compressed natural gas. We used the CNG then to uh, uh, drive uh, our power drilling or completion operations. We're also working with our third party gatherers to debottleneck the pipe so we can actually get more pipe in, more gas into the pipe so that we're not actually flaring it. I, I think these will lead to us are reducing our flaring in the back end by about half, uh, approximately about 100,000 tons a year. Bit further afield in Norway, uh, we, we manage the Great Norefka Fisk area. Uh, clearly, we have some significant uh, power requirements. Most of that is currently generated by gas turbines, uh, but we're now looking to put offshore wind turbines uh, to support our offshore facilities. We completed a study in 2020, and we intend to put two wind turbines offshore. They'll work in conjunction with the gas turbines uh, to obviously to drive cleaner, renewable fuel for those facilities. Uh, we'll reduce CO2 by about 75,000 tons, and we are looking at a second phase as well. Again, so a lot of happening, and you say probably more than just a couple of minutes to talk about. <laughs> well, thank you, Ori. Uh, Sharon? Uh, I, I would just echo what um, what we just talked about and really the advancing of, of clean fuels, I think, is critical. Excellent. Well, listen, uh, Sharon Warwick, thank you so much for joining us here today. I think that, that, that you know clearly we've seen some great themes uh, throughout the throughout the conversation on the you know need for technology innovation, but the partnerships with our supply chains and our government partners and all the rest. So, really appreciate you being part of our conversation today, uh, and look forward to catching up with you both soon. Likewise, thank you for having me. Bye bye. I'm here today with uh, Lord Barker, who will be able to provide a global perspective on businesses leading climate solutions. Lord Barker previously served as Energy and Climate Change Minister in the United Kingdom and played a key role in many landmark pieces of legislation in the UK. In 2017, he joined London listed Ian Plus Group, the world's largest producer of low carbon aluminum, I should say aluminum, not, not certain, and independent hydropower. He is co-chair of the Carbon Pricing Leadership Coalition at the World Bank. Uh, Lord Barker, thank you for joining us today. Great to be with you, Gary. Very good to see you. And uh, we are co-sponsoring this session with the International Emissions Trading uh, Association. So I would like us to start by reflecting on the role of trade in providing demand um, and supply for low carbon products and services. Where do you see trade is connecting uh, with the decarbonization process? Absolutely vital. If we don't have these big economic levers pulling the market towards a net zero world, we're not going to achieve them. Um, I'm not a, a purist and absolutist. I think carbon pricing for too long has been seen as the holy grail and very much a textbook solution to uh, many of the problems with the low carbon economy, but has remained untouched. And I think now it's really time for carbon pricing to come out of the textbook and onto the statute book. I think it covered, we have a carbon price covering now about 21% of the global economy, but there's huge potential for it to do more. And it really is the most effective policy lever out there to drive the, drive the transition. What we've got to do though, is have an inclusive conversation to make sure that some of the unintended consequences of carbon pricing are anticipated. Um, and so that we take those who might be hit by higher fuel prices, for example, in the poorest decile or in, the, or in, in um, countries where there aren't immediate chances to offset the impacts of a rising carbon price, um, that we use the revenue generated by a carbon price to help those people. We could, should be able to do with it. So it really is time to restart the conversation uh, prior to action on carbon pricing. You are representing you in, uh, an industry that is frequently classified as hard to abate. Uh, your suppliers and many of your customers come from the hard to abate industries. How do you see a transition for these companies for the whole supply value chain that you can remain profitable? Well, 
Um, I have to correct you there a little. Most of our customers are not in the hard to obey industry. So aluminium, we are the largest producer of low carbon aluminium in the world. And we are supplying several of the key critical building blocks of a low carbon economy. So electric vehicles can't be built without uh, super lightweight aluminium. Uh, renewable energy installations, 85% of a solar panel is typically made up of aluminium. Uh, reusable, uh, infinitely recyclable packaging like this uh, this can here, um, made of aluminium. Uh, sustainable buildings made of aluminium. So unlike sort of the fossil fuel industry, say, you know, the end use of our product is in fact highly sustainable, highly recyclable. Um, the question is, how do you make it in a way that is sustainable uh, and environmentally friendly? We start with the energy input, um, which is what we do. Um, so 98% of our uh, of the electricity that we use in our smelters comes from clean energy, hydro in our case. Um, we generate more hydro um, than all of the nuclear reactors in the UK put together um, to feed our smelters. Um, to put it in some sort of context that uh, US uh, viewers may, may understand, the Hoover Dam is about two gigawatts. Uh, and the N plus group, our, our resource is about 16 gigawatts. So it's eight Hoover dams. So if you, you, you're you using clean energy and you displace fossil fuels, you come at this um, with a great advantage. So if you use um, coal to produce aluminium, as 60% as of the world does, primarily in China, you're going to get, it's going to take 18 tonnes of carbon to produce just a one tonne of aluminium. Whereas if you use a clean energy source, it's going to take just two and a half tons of carbon to produce one ton of aluminium. But that's still too much. So we are determined to get to net zero as the rest of the industry must. And in actual fact, yesterday uh, we published our route map to net zero. We published a, a target at the beginning of the year. But as you know, Gary, a credible target is only credible if it's got a credible action plan to go with it. So we've done that. I think there are about 2,000 companies now that uh, have listed, have uh, committed to going to net zero by 2050 um, around the world, but only about 150 of them have published uh, plans which uh, are aligned with science-based targets that match up with the goals of Paris. So we need many more companies, particularly in the hard to abate sectors, to bring forward those ambitious plans. Not going to be easy. Um, it's going to have to make some assumptions about you know, breakthroughs in technology, but uh, we need them to come through and commit. And underlying that is, is carbon pricing. If we can get a global price on carbon, it's going to make it a lot easier for those hard to abate industries to make that transition. I, uh, I appreciate what you're saying about your industry and, and your value chain. And yet we are getting ready for Glasgow, where it will be the governments who will be negotiating. Um, from your experience, Lord Barker, and, and your vision, what would be the best positive outcome of COP? I mean, what's what's the holy grail there? Well, the holy grail is that we get alignment between the world's largest economies, the biggest polluters, and not just the polluters today, but also those who are going to be, if things don't change, um, producing more and more carbon pollution uh, in the future, by which I'm talking about you know, China and uh, India, as well as um, you know, the US and, and Europe, who in, uh, account for an increasingly small amount of, uh, of, of global carbon emissions. So we've got to, we've got to future-proof the world economy, and that really does mean a, a global consensus, which at the moment, given everything else going on in the world, seems pretty hard. But I think there are glimmers of, of optimism there, but it's going to take a hell of a push by world leaders to come together with a plan that really puts credible flesh on the bone of Paris. I mentioned you know, N plus making, making a commitment in January to get to net zero, but then bringing forward a route map uh, this week um, that really you know, put, sets out in detail how they're going to do it. That's exactly what we need world governments to do. Um, many of them signed up in Paris to those targets. We need them in Glasgow to come forward with the practical plans of how they're going to deliver it. But we in business have a vital role to play. Um, and uh, certainly, um, the uh, CDLP, the carbon, um, the car the, um, the carbon pricing leadership coalition um, that I co-chair, uh, will be an active participant at uh, at COP26. Um, we'd love more U.S. companies 
to uh, participate with us at Glasgow. And if anyone's interested, we've still got space on our panels there. We'd love some in-person uh, representation. Um, but there are already, already some great companies, but certainly room for more. Um, but that's it. You know, we've got to recognise that business is going to play a, a, a central role, and that's a re recurring theme of of uh, this this uh, this event. I think. Wonderful. Thank you for joining the session, and uh, we'll join you in Glasgow. Let's Look forward. To that. Fingers crossed. Well, this concludes our series of panels, which clearly demonstrate the business leadership on delivering on climate goals. Indeed, governments will negotiate, but it will be up to the business community to come up with the innovation, resources, determination, and skills to implement all of those agreements and do it together, together with uh, all of our customers, consumers, and partners around the world. Thank you very much for joining the US Chamber and the International Carbon Trade Association North America Summit for this important conversation. Thank you.